Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is my favourite Zelda game. It's not a perfect game by any means, but one thing it has are some pretty well designed and memorable dungeons. One of these in particular is one of my favourite dungeons in the entire series, Arbiter's Grounds, an ancient isolated prison set away from Hylian society on the outskirts of the Gerudo Desert. So let's take a look at its design. This video will focus less on the layout and structure of the dungeon and instead on what it contains. Thus the different parts of this video will be segmented into three sections. The obstacles you are presented, the tools you can use, and the dungeon's item. So let's begin. One thing Arbiter's Grounds does extremely well in regards to the hazards and challenges it presents is how it entwines its setting and theme. Arbiter's Grounds is a prison full of deceased and haunted creatures. It's a long forgotten tomb, yet still thriving in its own right. And this brings a beautifully fierce and unwelcoming ambience to it. Gears and contraptions are still spinning, creatures are still crawling around on the dungeon floor. For a dungeon which is themed around the deceased and forgotten, it's far from silent. The ambience is very well established in Arbiter's Grounds, and while it's illustrated well through visual and sound design, it's also communicated through elements of gameplay. The hazards and enemies in the environment want to make your life unpleasant and tedious in any way they can. This adds to the overall immersion of the dungeon. Many obstacles you face don't even feel like trials or challenges, but rather just another part of the scenery. An example we can look at for this are the spike traps found throughout the dungeon. Now, before I get into the design of this obstacle, I'd like to give credit to Mark Brown's YouTube series, Game Designer's Toolkit, for pointing out a common theme of design which he showcases how obstacles are introduced to the player in Super Mario 3D World. The video will be in the description below and at the end screen. But anyway, here's how it works with the immersive theme of Arbiter's Grounds. First off, relatively early into the dungeon, off to the side, is a spike trap out of your path. It appears as some old torture device in complete disrepair sticking to the theme of the old eroding prison. However, there are a few assumptions you can make just off a quick glance. It's connected to a circular base, indicating that it may have moved or rotated at some earlier point, and the spikes have numerous skulls on them, indicating that they deal damage. So if you accidentally or deliberately walk into them, sure enough, you take damage. Now this is crafted relatively well, because you learn what the danger is from a safe space, and only take damage if you ignore the obvious warnings, which are the skulls. The danger is disguised as an environmental detail, opposed to a blatant warning pushed in your face. With this in mind, either consciously or subconsciously, up ahead is a functioning version of the same trap. It's relatively easy to avoid, but is now an active threat opposed to a passive one. You'll have to pass by the spike trap numerous times, so you'll get more familiar with the timing. Finally, later on, you'll deal with this exact hazard again, but in a very different environment. This spike trap is in the way of the spinner track. It moves at the exact same speed, however you are moving a lot faster and have far less options. You can't speed up with rolling or change your angle like on foot, you can only time your approach. With this one obstacle, we have it showcased in a mostly harmless environment, it presented as a challenge which is manageable, and in a more difficult environment where the player has to adapt to new changes. All of this disguised as an old torture device used eons ago to make it feel like just another part of the environment the player is traversing. This isn't just limited to these spike traps either. Let's take the chain mechanic as another example. The first one is very simplistic, which you just pull out to lower the stairs. Then later on, you pull a much longer chain all the way out to raise the chandelier and run past it before it falls down. However, you can't pull it out all the way, so you have to push a block into position to allow for more space. So now there is a problem preventing you from pulling out the chain and there is pressure of making it pass within the time limit. Both of these things are add-ons to the first version, making it harder and more complex. And finally on the third time you have to move into the centre of the chandelier in order to use it as an elevated platform, which you have to figure out in the first place. Again, this is taking the same concept but adding an additional challenge or twist. Instead of just having to run past, now you have to figure out what to do while the chandelier is up, and put yourself in a potentially risky position underneath it. And just like with the spike traps, it blends right into the environment. While functionally you're lifting up a platform with a convenient hole right in the middle, aesthetically you're using the environment's old abandoned contraptions to your advantage. You also have to walk over the same type of chandelier back in the larger hall, which just helps disguise it as another part of the environment, rather than a puzzle. 
Many other hazards in Arbiter's Grounds follow a similar multi-step aesthetically hidden philosophy, such as blade traps, sinking platforms, quicksand, floor spikes, the pose, and even the precursing stealth area to a degree. When playing through the dungeon, pay attention to how the obstacles are presented to you, and notice how the difficulty is gradually increased. In this type of setting, the best way to present an obstacle is to make it appear as if it's a part of the environment itself. However, in regards to Link's arsenal, let's analyse how Arbiter's Grounds gets the right balance of utilising Link's toolkit. One field Arbiter's Grounds does rather well is the way it utilises the player's existing toolkit and knowledge. This is something Twilight Princess tends to lack and is often criticised for. Arbiter's Grounds is the fourth temple in Twilight Princess, so it doesn't have an overbearing amount of key items to have to work with. With what's been presented so far, it utilises them relatively well, such as using the lantern to open up doors, using the claw shot to traverse over quicksand, turning into Wolf Link to shake off some creepy undead rats, or using a bomb to finish off an annoying Stealthos. But something that's rather effective about Arbiter's Grounds is the inclusion of ways Link can use his arsenal and how it encourages some experimentation. For example, poison mites will avoid you if you have your lantern out. Or, you can pull Moldrums right out of the sand with a claw shot to make fighting them less obnoxious. This is something Breath of the Wild does particularly well, by allowing you to discover new solutions to problems from experimenting with the tools at your disposal. And just like in Breath of the Wild, you aren't blatantly told you can do this, but are left to figure it out on your own and at your own pace, which is always a plus in my book. That's not discrediting in any way how Arbiter's Grounds incorporates Link's toolkit into its main progression, however, because that is also done rather well. Now, the key item may be the spinner, which we'll get to soon, but a function that is probably just as prominent is Link's ability to transform into Wolf Link. Considering you only gained this ability a short while ago, Arbiter's Grounds gives you a perfect introduction to this new function. Now, at this point in the game, you've only recently gained the ability to turn into Wolf Link and have learnt about Pose, so you have an understanding of this function, but it's still a novelty. Now, outside Arbiter's Grounds are two Poes, which are rather close together considering how Poes are traditionally scattered. The first being a bit before the entrance, and the other right outside the dungeon itself. There are two reasons why this is important. One, in order to fight Poes, you need to transform into Wolf Link, which is a key theme of Arbiter's Grounds. So, it works as a bit of a foreshadow. And two, these two Poes are put relatively close to one another, closer than Poes traditionally would be. This helps reinforce the familiarity of frequently changing into Wolf Link by making the need reoccur, opposed to occurring every now and then. And you're even given a spot where you can dig up rupees, just to help with that positive reinforcement. Now, let's focus on one of the most iconic elements from Arbiter's Grounds, its key item. The spinner is the embodiment of what I love about Twilight Princess's key items, which is less about their actual function and more how they empower you and change the dungeon's pace, like how the Gale Boomerang allows you to move bridges in the Forest Temple, or the Claw Shot allows you to shoot right over walls and across large gaps in the Lakebed Temple. These items provide you with a way to traverse new areas which were impossible before, and the same areas in a fresh new way, but in the form of a new tool to master, rather than just an outright solution. Some dungeons in Twilight Princess do this better than others, which Arbiter's Grounds is a good example of. The spinner entirely changes how you traverse Arbiter's Grounds, probably the most out of any respective dungeon item in Twilight Princess. First of all, it provides you a solution to a common obstacle Arbiter's Grounds presents you with. Quicksand now much more easily traversed than before. Next is how it works as a literal key to move structures of the dungeon, a smaller function but still very useful. And finally being able to ride the railing found throughout the entire dungeon, which is the biggest thing, which is where the mastery comes into play. This immediately not only unlocks a plethora of new areas and challenges, but also completely changes the pace of the dungeon. Movement up to this point has been relatively slow, like you're trudging through quicksand, sometimes quite literally. But now the sheer speed of the spinner and quantity of newly available tracks completely changes the feel and pace of Arbiter's Grounds. Things feel fresh and fast-paced, like the entire dungeon has been turned on its head. Now you not only have a new tool to get around obstacles, but a whole new method of movement to master, which builds upon aspects you've experienced up to this point. For example, going back to the spike traps, the third stage in their design is simply when you have the spinner. You have to adapt to the exact same obstacles, but with a new method of movement. What's great about the spinner is that it isn't quite a direct solution to a key problem but rather a mechanic that holds said solution. 
Overall, Arbiter's Grounds is effective with how it entwines its strong aesthetic, its game design, Link's toolkit, and the presented key item into a creepy yet fun package, making the dungeon feel like a surprising and engaging journey into a forgotten, eroding prison, opposed to just another Zelda dungeon. It's certainly a favourite of mine, and I hope now you can understand why. I'm Prime Hylian, and thanks for watching.